Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We're, uh, oh, turn that off. Okay, yeah. <laughs> My sound man said I've got too many microphones on. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted you're here. You weren't uh, terribly rained upon, and uh, very happy that you could join us this afternoon. This is, uh, this is a real privilege uh, to welcome the Prime Minister. Um, uh, as you undoubtedly know, the Prime Minister is in the running to be the next Secretary General for the United Nations. And this is going to be her first venue in Washington to uh, be able to talk to us in this capacity as a candidate. I'm very proud about that because uh, we were the first place that Ban Ki-moon came when he came to Washington, D.C. to announce that he wanted to be here. So I think there's a pattern here, uh, <laughs> Prime Minister. I think I, uh, one of her assistants said, is there a guarantee that she'll get elected? I said, absolutely. I'm willing to, <laughs> I'm willing to guarantee anything. Uh, but we are really quite honored and privileged that the Prime Minister would be here with us this afternoon. Um, it's coming at a time when we're having a very strange debate in America. Um, we were just talking about this. You know, America championed the creation of the international UN complex of organizations. We saw that as central to our interests uh, now 70 years ago. Uh, it, recently, we've become a bit disenchanted as a nation. I think that's a tragic mistake. If you were to look at the 20th century, the first half of it was absolutely horrible. The second half was rather glorious for humanity. And what distinguished the first and the second half was we had a set of international institutions that existed to help deal with transnational problems that we could not resolve ourselves as individual nation states. We made a lot of bad choices the first half of the 20th century. Thankfully, we had institutions that were able to guide us and to help modulate the tensions that exist in international relations. Americans have forgotten this. And it's part of our obligation to bring back this consciousness of the very important role that the United Nations and the United Nations organizations play for all of us to make it a safer and better world, a safer and a stronger and a better America. So that's really what's at stake now when we're looking at the next leadership of the United Nations. And we're just, uh, just very honored that the Prime Minister, Helen Clark, is willing to be a candidate, and uh, I'm now cheating you from hearing her. So would you, with your applause, please welcome <laughs> her, the Honorable Helen Clark. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. In the course of my life, I've made a number of speeches in Washington, D.C., but this is the first one I've made as a, a candidate for the position of uh, Secretary General. And I was going to begin uh, with a, a quote uh, from the first Secretary General of the UN, who was Norwegian, who went to the airport to meet Doug Hammarskjöld uh, when he was coming to take up the position. And he said to him, Doug, you are about to take over the world's most impossible job. I don't think anything much has changed about that. <laughs> Indeed, the way the world is in an era of highly disruptive uh, global change, uh, the way we're interconnected, all the complexities probably make the role more challenging than it was uh, then. And uh, therefore, it's a good thing that there's quite an intense competition to take on this, this role and uh, many opportunities to compare and contrast uh, the different candidates and what they can bring to uh, the position. Uh, so let me say a little bit about myself and what has motivated me to step into the arena as a candidate and what the challenges I see facing the next Secretary General in the UN are and the priorities I'd set for myself. Before becoming UNDP Administrator seven years and three months ago, I served for nine years as New Zealand Prime Minister. And that was the culmination of a 27-year parliamentary career in New Zealand. Our electoral system since the mid-1990s has uh, produced coalition and or minority governments. And mine was no exception. I led uh, minority coalition governments for nine years. I don't think I ever lost a vote in the parliament. So what does that tell you? It tells you that when you are operating in situations of considerable complexity, you have eyes and ears, you reach out, you have dialogue, you have focal points, you act to bring people together around the issues. 
And of course, uh, being a New Zealand leader in the Asia Pacific, which is a hugely diverse region and not least in uh, political systems and outlooks, these are important skills to have, to be able to look for where the, the, the issues one can make common cause are. All very vital skills for a UN Secretary General to have, trying to bring together the broadest possible family uh, to find solutions to complex uh, problems. My own interests in international affairs go back to student days and when I say to you I began at the University of Auckland in 1968, you will immediately start thinking of all the things that were going on in the US around 1968 uh, through to the 70s. And actually in, in New Zealand the big issue for us as students was the anti-apartheid movement. That was really a, a galvanising uh, uh, movement. But uh, these issues got me uh, very interested in, in our world and how to contribute to uh, making it a, a better place. Uh, and I have had the opportunity uh, these last few years as UNDP Administrator to make a contribution. And now I'm looking to take the skills and experience I have up to the, the level of the 38th floor of the iconic building in New York City. And I'm very honoured to have the full active and official support of the New Zealand government for this candidacy. Bear in mind, this is a government that defeated my government. So it says something very nice about <laughs> New Zealand, that we act bilaterally uh, at home around deserving uh, candidacies. So I've come in to the selection process acutely aware that the UN has to step up its performance. And put rather bluntly, I do worry for its future. I think there is a real risk that it could drift to the periphery of world affairs, actually at the very time when it's most needed, at this time of disruptive global change. The very time when we, the peoples of the United Nations, as the Charter describes the membership, need to have confidence in the UN's capacity to help resolve the world's many problems and not be a bystander. So I think it is a time for a Secretary General to come to the post who has global standing and profile and political experience and who can ensure that the United Nations is considered a highly valuable partner by the world's current and emerging powers. Of course, the Secretary General must also understand and have empathy with the world's many small states which look to the UN and international law to protect their rights and interests. And coming from a rather small country in the South Pacific with many small island developing states as their neighbours, that comes rather naturally to me. So I come to it with a combination of the high level political leadership as a long serving Prime Minister and regional leader and the multilateral experience uh, at the UN. Uh, I have been immersed the last seven years and three months in development issues, and I say development meaning very broadly, sustainable development covering the whole spectrum, uh, certainly including the very challenging climate issues that uh, we face as well. I don't think any other candidate could match the engagement I've had with Africa, which uh, constitutes about half of the Security Council's uh, business. But the work I've been involved in has seen me very close to what UNDP does across every developing region and country from the most fragile and complex to the most uh, stable. Now sitting where I've been sitting as UNDP Administrator at one UN plaza and not in the Secretariat which is across the road, I am somewhat acutely aware of the strengths and flaws of the UN system. And I've taken steps to lift the performance of UNDP significantly. Uh, steps which have led it to be ranked the last two years running as the most transparent aid organisation in the world. That means more transparent than USAID, more transparent than any other aid organisation in the world. This was a huge culture change because it was a typical multilateral inward looking organisation that never told anybody much about itself. Now, what do you want to know? Go to open .undp.org, it's all there. We put everything out. Uh, so uh, observing what it has been possible to do, uh, leading change at UNDP, I think that uh, I can bring some of uh, these skills of spring cleaning organisations which are a little bit tired uh, to the Secretariat. 
And bear in mind that New Zealand is widely considered to have a very streamlined, effective and modern public administration as, as well. The Secretary General, then what would be the uh, priorities? Uh, I've been travelling around the capitals of Security Council member states uh, for the best part of the last uh, couple of months. And I think there's a, a reasonable measure of agreement around what the priorities for the next SG should be. And the two top priorities in, in matters of substance are really very much linked. Uh, there is definitely a need to strengthen the conflict prevention and peacekeeping side of the shop, uh, and definitely a strong desire to see a Secretary General continue to lead on the development and environment issues, which comes very naturally to me, as I've said. Now, last year, President Obama, in a very welcome initiative, led a drive to encourage more member states to come forward and contribute peacekeepers to the United Nations. And without question, we need to expand the number of troop contributing countries. We also need to ensure that those troops are uniformly well trained. And when we look at issues like the appalling sexual exploitation and abuse, uh, we know that training that says that such behaviour is completely unacceptable and will lead to uh, consequences is, is absolutely vital. But peacekeepers need to be well supported in the field. We have some very, very deadly missions uh, these days, Mali uh, the most uh, deadly. There is a lot of work to do around the way we support and train and equip uh, our peacekeepers. Uh, but to me, the very fact that we are committing peacekeepers is a sign that the UN has failed in its primary role of conflict prevention. And I think we need to look for new ways to strengthen its preventive capacity, including through better use of early warning systems and mediation. We need to draw on the very extensive presence the UN has around the world. And UNDP, which leads the UN country teams around the world, is present in 168 countries and territories. It's a very extensive on-the-ground presence. There's not much goes on that we don't know about, but nor is that necessarily well-linked and well-coordinated uh, to the systems on the political and uh, security side of the UN. So we need to use the extensive presence we have and really build these very, very close partnerships with others in a position to help to defuse contact. They may be neighbours, they may be great powers, uh, they may be regional organisations, they may be found in all kinds of places, but we have to get better at this. And I think I can develop and proactively use the good officer's role of the Secretary General. Now the Secretary General role, like that of the New Zealand Prime Minister, is not a well-prescribed role. I come from a country that has no written constitution. It never says what the Prime Minister's powers are. If you look at the UN Charter for guidance on the Secretary General's powers, you could be forgiven for thinking that perhaps the person takes the minutes. Uh, there's certainly not a general, there's no army. But actually, it, it's an enormous soft power position. It's convening. It's facilitating. It requires experience, leadership, diplomatic skills, judgment. A good Rolodex actually helps rather a lot. Uh, these ways of operating are not unusual to me as a New Zealand uh, Prime Minister. But on the broader context of conflict prevention, I come back to the new global agenda, the Agenda 2030, which is a breakthrough and a development agenda because it specifically addresses, and one of the key goals, the critical importance of having peaceful and inclusive societies and seeing building such societies based on the rule of law and access to justice and transparent and inclusive institutions as part of building a sustainable peace and sustainable uh, development. And the investments long term and medium term in building those kinds of societies are, are absolutely vital for the sustainable peace uh, that we, we need. Now, we have to keep at this work of addressing uh, the root causes of what undermines uh, societies and tips them over into a conflict, or we face the grim consequences, which are sadly today's status quo of protracted conflicts, forced displacement at 
very, very high levels and more. We need to think and act much more holistically across the UN's different pillars, its development pillar, its humanitarian, its human rights, its political, its peacekeeping uh, pillars. And I personally would take it as my responsibility to see these well coordinated in a way they are not today. We have to fight today's security challenges arising from the breakdown of social cohesion, from the civil wars, the terrorism and the violent extremism with well coordinated and 21st century tools. Which, to paraphrase Aristotle, would see the whole of our efforts add up to rather more than the sum of their parts. Third priority, absolutely looking at organisational efficiency. Accelerating the modernisation of the administrative and budgetary systems and human resource management. Again, I think it's very important that the Secretary General takes personal responsibility uh, for this, for appointing the people who can drive through the changes needed for a more efficient organisation. The reorganisation I led at UNDP reduced our administrative costs, reduced the number of staff and increased funds for development. I think member states deserve to know that every dollar they contribute is well spent. The United States is, is one of the quite a number of countries which take a very, very close interest in the value for money uh, issue and we're getting very valuable input uh, from the US on things that, that could be done. I'm listening extremely closely to all those who have a concern and want to see better uh, value for, for money. Uh, so, before handing over for a moderated session with our president, uh, let me say a word on the long-standing friendship between the United States of America and New Zealand. Uh, coming here over the years as I have to this capital in different capacities, a point I've often made is that there were roughly half a dozen countries in the 20th century which managed to maintain continuous democratic governance. One was yours and one was mine. There's a very deep value base to this. Uh, I know from my grandparents and parents' generations, they were forever grateful for a decision which FDR took during the Second World War. Most of our armed forces were actually stuck in the Middle East when the fall of Singapore in January 1942 left the South Pacific exposed. And FDR pledged that the US would come to New Zealand's defence and that of Australia. And as in World War I, the US entry into the war was decisive and long-term friendships came from those uh, endeavours. In my own time as New Zealand Prime Minister, I was privileged to be welcomed to the White House on two occasions by President George W. Bush and to meet him regularly at APEC summits. New Zealand was a very early mover in dispatching special forces to Afghanistan after 9-11 and in establishing a provincial reconstruction team in that country. As UNDP Administrator, of course, I've been greatly supported by the United States' contributions to our work and its willingness to see the organisation I lead as a key partner. So, should I be honoured to be selected as the next UN Secretary General, I do bring with me a legacy of friendship for the United States and of understanding the vital role the United States plays in the establishment of the organisation in the first place 71 years ago and continuing to support the UN Charter and its mandate on peace and security and development and human rights. As you said, John, playing a role to try to solve problems which the US and no other single country can solve on its own. If we did not have this organisation, we would have to invent it. We have it. We need to reinvent it, renovate it, spring clean it, make it better but we can't do without it, neither large countries nor small countries. And for me, it would be an incredible privilege and opportunity uh, to bring the experience and skills I have to that task. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a splendid overview. Thank you. Um, uh, and let me, let me begin kind of at the point where you were at the very end when you talked about renovating um, the institution. 
Um, I think one of the reasons that the United Nations has survived where the League of Nations failed was that the League of Nations was built around aspirations of the way we wanted the world to be, whereas the United Nations was built on the world as it existed. The power geometry of 1947, uh, obviously that gave shape to the Security Council, um, yeah, but now we have a very different power geometry in the world. Mm -hmm. it, it, it really doesn't make sense you know, to have you know, Japan not be on the Security Council or Germany mm -hmm. or India, you know, this sort of thing. Now, I realize you're not going to mm -hmm. talk in detail about who you would bring on and who you'd kick off uh, at this stage when you're running for office, but um, <laughs> let me ask you to talk about a process. Mm -hmm. What would be the process of making the power geometry uh, of the world better reflected inside mm -hmm. the United Nations Security Council? Well, it, it is an issue, and I think it's an issue not only for the United Nations, but it's also been an issue for the international financial institutions based uh, right mm -hmm. here in, in Washington, D.C., that the, the world is not the world of you know, San Francisco and Bretton Woods 70-plus uh, mm -hmm. uh, years ago. But the, the challenge is always how to change. And the uh, changing the composition of the UN Security Council is just about as difficult as changing the American Constitution <laughs> because it was set up, of course, with a veto power. And, uh, and, to, and to change requires the consent of all uh, veto power wielding uh, countries, as, as well as, of course, needing a, a very substantial body of agreement among the member states themselves. So what can you do as Secretary General? You can encourage the debate because I think it is critical to seeing that the Security Council architecture better reflects the world of today uh, than of 1945. You can offer technical support, expertise, encourage, convene, uh, to try to, I think, nudge the member states towards really decisively addressing this. I remember it came to a head around the time of the 60th anniversary uh, when I was New Zealand Prime Minister. We debated it at great length in our Cabinet External Relations Committee. Uh, as to what um, we as a small country would be prepared to, uh, to support. It, it's, it's not simple, but uh, would I say change is essential? Yes, I would. I mean, think uh, how little the architecture of the Council uh, resembles the geopolitics of today and then put ourselves forward another 20 years if there's not change. It, you know, I, th I think it, it is really a very pressing issue and can only encourage the diplomats to address it energetically. Is it something that the, the Secretary General could establish a process that would open up a way to at least ventilate ideas? I know it's very hard. Your relationship mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. Security Council, people mm -hmm. don't really understand it all that well. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's not a direct relationship. And, how, how, what might be a step that you could take as a Secretary General? Well, I think there is a feeling that in the past uh, uh, Secretary Generals have been quite engaged with this, probably around the time of the concerted effort in, uh, mm -hmm. in 2005 and the 60th uh, anniversary. So I think what one would want to do is put out feelers among the member states. Is, is there an appetite for you know, some more active facilitation of, of the discussion? I mean, the, the discussion is live and bubbling and the views are quite polarised. Uh, so what could you do to try to create a platform for that to be, to be talked through? What's, what's the give and take that's going to, to resolve this? I think, I think that's the approach. I'm certainly willing to put some political mm -hmm. capital uh, into mm -hmm. it in the interest of the organisation uh, retaining relevance. Uh, let me... Um uh, you know, shift to talk. You, you talked about America's it, it's, it, initially its leadership role. Now it, it's ambivalence, you know, about the UN. And we've during this period, we've you know, our foreign policy, we've moved from bipartisanship to bipolarism. You know, I mean, we're pretty pretty wacky sometimes on uh, on foreign policy these days. What you know, and the UN is is really viewed ambivalently. I mean, uh, it, there are days when we resent it, and then there are days when we turn to you and ask you to do things that are almost beyond what you can do. How do you? How do we establish a more uh, kind of a mature uh, relationship at this stage between the United Nations and the United States? 
Well, I mean, your country wouldn't be unusual in the ambivalent attitudes. I remember when I first put my hand up to be UNDP administrator and there was a you know, great debate in the New Zealand media. People said, why would you want to go to the UN? It's corrupt, it's bureaucratic, it can't do anything. You know, the whole, all the list of things you'd, you'd expect. Um, and when I came to UNDP, I remember on day one meeting the senior management team, I said, nothing matters more to me than everything being clean, above board, transparent, the money properly managed. You know, we can never have any suggestion that there is any tolerance of malfeasance, nothing, you know. So clean, upright, effective, performance oriented, results oriented and so on. And, and I think we've turned it round. Uh, we don't uh, hear those things uh, about about our organisation. So I think it's, um, what I would need to explore is how would you make uh, the secretariat the kind of transparent organisation that uh, you can make the major development wing mm -hmm. of, of uh, the UN appear. Uh, and I think we need to be externally facing, uh, not defensive. You know, not everything goes well all the time, but be frank about what does and, 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 and what doesn't. Um, I think value for money is a huge issue. I think over time, if you don't review any large organisation, governmental, private, whatever, you get creep, you get mandate creep, you get duplication, you get uh, management layer creep. I, I think there's, there's quite a lot uh, to do that would assure taxpayers that there, there is better uh, value for money. And as mm. having been a Prime Minister, I'm very acutely aware that you go out to the public yeah, to ask yeah. for the money. So uh, it, 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 it really does matter. And then in terms of effectiveness, I, I think uh, we need to play the UN back into the game of being more effective on the conflict prevention side. Actually, the development side is a relative success. Mm -hmm. uh, generally out there in the field, it, it's pretty mm -hmm. well regarded. Uh, but, uh, you know, go to parts of the world which are raging in conflict, the view of the UN isn't so positive because it's not seen to have answers or necessarily to be particularly engaged. I think we've got quite a lot to do. Can I ask you, in, in the early days of the United Nations, uh, obviously there were development roles, there were conflict prevention roles, but there was also an extremely important role which was for the United Nations to provide kind of a transcending legitimacy of sovereignty when there was no local legitimate sovereign government. Mm -hmm. Part of this was as, as we were seeing the decolonization around mm -hmm. the world and mm -hmm. the UN played a key role in coming in and mm -hmm. establishing a mm -hmm. process. We're mm -hmm. now living in an era where it looks like so, some of the nation states that emerged after the war are now starting to fall apart. You know, the Sykes-Picot regime appears to be falling apart. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to Scotland. Uh, you know, mm. Spain is wrestling mm. internally. Mm. There, it seems to me that there is another role for the United Nations, which is to this transcending role of providing legitimacy through mm. political transition. Mm. What mm. are your thoughts about this? Well, I saw that at first hand with the birth of Timor-Leste. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I very well recall just at the end of my time as leader of the opposition in New Zealand, uh, the, the fall of the old regime in, in, uh, in Jakarta. And uh, Timor-Leste had a very bloody birth. Yes, uh, it was awful. Very, very bloody birth. And, New Zealand was one of the countries which, which stepped up uh, to be there as the UN came in really and, and took over and ran the transition uh, through to independence in May 2002 and I, I went to the, uh, the ceremony at that time having earlier visited the, the country. I think one thing uh, we learnt about that but then didn't continue to apply the lessons and I'll come back to that was that to go from having been where Timor-Leste was as, in effect, a, you know, a colonised territory uh, to independence in, in barely two and a half years uh, and expect everything to work properly, that was over-optimistic. And almost immediately independence was was over, you know, victory was declared and there were drawdowns of peacekeepers and so on. It, you know, wasn't so long after that, a couple of years, two, three years, that uh, there was then a concerted uh, attempt on the life of the, 
the president of the country and the prime minister of the country and uh, the leaders were on the phone saying, Helen, would you send peacekeepers back? Uh, so then the UN went back in quite a concerted way again. Now, it seems to me that we're seeing some of the same issues play out in South Sudan. Uh, what yes. about the history of South Sudan would lead us to expect that from July 2011 it would be plain sailing? You see, I think, I think the, the engagement has to be for uh, the, the longer term. And uh, anyway, it, it, it's, it's a long, long story, but to go from not having had any of the institutions of a state, not having had the identity of a state or, or, or a nation, not having the social cohesion, uh, to peaceful statehood is, is a huge hill to climb and I think uh, the UN does have a role to play in supporting transitions more effectively and for longer but it needs member states support to do that and so often with so many crises we're off to the next one you know we well that that's good independence declared that you know, the job's done but but it's not done when you come out of this this kind of history of turmoil it does suggest that there is this is a a, a, a key role for the United Nations that no one else can provide. Correct. Really, it just Correct. doesn't have the legitimacy Correct. that the United. When I talk with with uh, international NGOs, for example, they need to have the United Nations there as the le creating the legitimate forum mm. for them to be able to be involved. And it strikes me mm. that this is a, both an underappreciated dimension mm. of the UN, but probably maybe an under underexercised strength of the UN. In, in the development system, we get very used to saying that, you know, what our added value is, what's our value proposition. And we say, A, we represent the United Nations, the premier multilateral organization. Uh, we are here to uphold the charter, the, the treaties, the international law and, and conventions. Uh, we have unique convening power because of this uh, legitimacy. We can bring people together. We stay above the politics, but we're not value neutral. We are very committed to the values of, of the charter. So it is a unique position, and I think uh, the, the values that are expressed are, are very much values that resonate here in the United States of, of America yep. around democracy and, and, and the, the basic rule rights law, and freedoms, and rule of law. Mm -hmm. Let me, you know, there are two, two forms of internationalism. We've got mm -hmm. structural internationalism where it's based on a treaty and people mm -hmm. agree in advance, nations agree mm -hmm. in advance how they're going to cooperate and establish modalities of cooperation and then we get coalitions of the willing you know whether it's the G7 or the G20 or you know some other group that comes together it's very easy to pull together a coalition of the willing but it's not normative because it you know one coalition doesn't help you with the next problem structural internationalism where the United Nations obviously has a great sense of legitimacy but becomes brittle you know it, it gets captured by folkways and Mm. I'm wondering how you're thinking about how to integrate mm. the power of the United Nations yeah. as a normative international structure, mm. but working with these, mm. these coalitions, mm. these, these consensus-based yeah. international mechanisms mm. that seem to be a bit more dynamic, actually, mm. to get things done. How, how are you thinking you might integrate Well, this? this has been a very interesting question with the development of the G20. Uh, because prior to the global financial crisis, the G20 existed, but it had not met at leader level. It had met at, uh, at finance minister level. And then uh, with the crisis, uh, uh, President Bush actually took the initiative to call a meeting in, in late uh, 2008, as I recall. And then Jordan, Gordon Brown held the major summit in London which uh, pulled together a rescue package for the, the world right. economy. I think we can say it was a, a big, bold uh, mm -hmm. package. Mm -hmm. uh, now, so, so the leaders level meetings came uh, because nobody else seemed to be able to do it. So you could draw together leaders of you know, not necessarily the, the world's 20 biggest economies, but you know, give or take, right, right, it, right, it right, more right. or less mm -hmm. uh, re re represented that. Um, but I, I have been observing the G20 very closely ever since I came to this position and I have attended many meetings of the finance ministers as the representative of, of the UN. Uh, firstly, the G20 doesn't have an ongoing 
secretariat or right. institutional life. So what it can do is mobilize the opinion of the major economy leaders, but when it actually needs some things changed in the international architect, it has to come back to the IMF, to, to other organizations, maybe e even to the UN. So it's been quite interesting to see the interplay between the informal multilateralism and then needing to come back to those who do have the power to negotiate uh, the, the, the treaties and make uh, binding, binding arrangements. Uh, there's another uh, point that occurs when you use the term uh, coalition of the, w of the willing. And I think uh, that when it comes to, to peacekeeping and acting in crisis, uh, it's not always possible for the UN to act very speedily on that. Uh, but it, it's certainly not unknown at all for the UN to pass framework resolutions which enable others uh, to, mm -hmm. to come to help. And I think that can be a, a very, very uh, useful, useful tool. It, it may be a, a mandated force, but not a force of the, the UN itself. And it may be that in fighting some of the new threats we face uh, uh, with the nature of terrorism, that there could be more of that, because the UN peacekeeping, as it's configured, really can't do counter-terrorism. <laughs> Uh, it does, uh, I think, rely on others with other skills and depth of capacity. Yeah, I mean, the UN obviously has the transcending capacity to confer legitimacy. Correct. Where coalitions of the willing will always be challenged as to whether it is legitimate because yeah. just they have agreed to act. And yeah. Finding some way for the UN and these various coalitions to, to work more effectively, you know, st strategically, it strikes me would be a great opportunity. Oh, de definitely, and I think we, we've seen that in the evolution of the G20, because initially it didn't really want too much to do with the, the UN. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But then uh, over a series of, of uh, presidencies of the G20, it came to be realized that actually you needed to interact with the UN because the UN expressed also views from the whole body of the membership. Yeah, of so it has become much more inclusive and it's become a matter of course for G20 presidencies to come to brief the General Assembly, the ECOSOC, for you know, our officials, myself, the people who've worked under me mm -hmm. as deputies mm -hmm. and Sherpas in the finance stream, people on development work, we are all over it. Uh, so what started as informal multilateralism of big players with no connection actually has become very closely connected. That's very interesting. Okay, folks, we've got, uh, we've got about uh, 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes, we can take questions. Do we have a microphone that we're going to work around? Okay. Uh, let me start right over here in the corner. This, uh, right, halfway down, no, come down, come down, there you go. Put your arm way up, there you go. She's right behind you. And say who you are, please. Of course, and I'm going to address you as Secretary General Clark. So, <laughs> oh, a, this is what we call a ringer. Rabin, Rabin Pasha, I'm founder of the My Entrepreneurial Dream organization and uh, movement to engage young people in entrepreneurship and taking hold of their own future in the Middle East, and starting with uh, Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan, where I originally came from as a refugee 20 years ago, and actually seven years and three months ago, I went back to Iraq, joined the UN for a couple of years working on the UNDAF, so thank you for that. Um, I started this after years of international development because I see the issues of youth engagement and entrepreneurship and some of the things that, uh, thank you for your attention to the Let's conflict. get a question here. We're taking a yeah. long introduction. Question. Sure. Well, one of, one of the areas of engaging youth is not only in inclusive economic development and in trade, but also in building that sustainability of uh, creating peace and working with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your leadership and good governance within UNDP. What would you, I, I would love to hear your thoughts of what you would do in bringing that youth agenda and creating creating a more of a, a diverse array of opinions, local partners bringing that into the UN to address these challenges of fragility that is marring the countries in the Middle East and how you would also engage more of the donor countries and appeal to them in um, uh, sustaining that agenda within the United Nations. Thank you so much. Well, I think this is a, a huge issue because we have in some of the, well, probably most of the very unstable countries, uh, a very large youth demographic, and youth don't see much opportunity. Uh, I was in, uh, in Mali 
a few months ago. And uh, Mali with two thirds of the demographics under the age of 26 and very little opportunity. And one senior UN official there said to me, well, you know, the youth look at it and they see not much positive to do, but there are a lot of negative opportunities. And you can get, you know, paid, say, $300 a month, she cited, uh, for being a terrorist or a jihadist, which is a lot of money in Mali. Uh, or you can become just some other kind of criminal uh, and traffic goods and people and, and drugs and guns and so on. Or the fourth option she gave was you could hike up to Libya and get the boat to Europe. <laughs> and we see the tragedy played out in the Mediterranean every day. Uh, this led me to a conversation I had with the Prime Minister uh, eventually on the visit. And I said, I, th I feel, uh, using English terms, <laughs> that uh, we're fighting here the three eyes. He said, what are they? I said, well, one eye is income poverty. There's not enough opportunity. It's really a huge need to invest in the human capital and the, the opportunities uh, uh, for youth. Uh, the second eye is ignorance because the level of illiteracy is very high and the number of people who've never, never got to school and still aren't in school is very high. And then the third thing is the perceived sense of injustice that life isn't fair to me, or if you're in the North, life isn't fair to me because the North doesn't do so well. So if we attack these three eyes, we attack some of the, the root causes. But I think uh, opportunity for youth is absolutely critical to getting stability. Uh, look, in my own society, in this society, what do youth with nothing to do do? Uh, Actually, a lot do rather bad things. In my country, they join youth gangs, and they're unpleasant. They join them here. Now, the options open to youth in fragile countries uh, are similar in nature. Uh, it's not really the ideology, for the most part, they're joining. It's, it's a gang. It's a club. It's status. It's, it's something to do. We have to create positive opportunities for people. OK, let's let this lady right over here. We'll bring a microphone down. Thank you so much for speaking today. Uh, my name is Elise Baranowski, and I work at an international human rights law firm here in Washington, DC. So as you know, human rights are one of the three pillars of the United Nations, yet they receive less than 4% of the UN's budget, roughly 3.5%. And I saw that one of your fellow candidates committed in writing to working with the Fifth Committee to increase the funding for the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights by 50% on a sustainable basis. I was wondering if you'd be willing to do the same or even better. Thank you. Uh, I can say I'm not writing the budget now, <laughs> uh, but the other point, uh, look, I'm very happy to look at how the Human Rights uh, Commission is resourced, but the other point I would make is that across the UN family, there are many people working on human rights. You take my own organisation. We have worked on the establishment and strengthening of more than 80 national human rights institutions around the world. Many of this work is, much of this work is still ongoing. Uh, we work, and UNDP is not alone in this, a range of agencies are involved, uh, with the universal periodic review process, which is a good process. I think the best thing that came out of the reform that produced the Human Rights Council. And uh, all countries have to report under that uh, framework, as you know. Uh, for many, it is quite a challenging exercise, and the story isn't so good. Uh, and many don't... Uh, have the, the contacts with civil society, indeed civil society may be in quite a difficult position in a number of countries, to be able to engage civil society in the way the Human Rights Council expects as well. So very often we, as again these, these actors with legitimacy, are called in to support countries to compile a UPR. And then uh, in countries with very challenging human rights uh, situations, they will come back from that hearing with a long list of recommendations. And then the phone will go, what are we going to do with this? And we will then be called in, and as I say, not just UNDP, there's a range of us uh, working in this area, uh, to say, well, you know, we really urge you to accept recommendations, but those you're going to accept, then you need to work out what would you need to do to implement it. There will be policy to be drawn up, laws to be passed, new regulations, new things that have to be done. Uh, so I know on a practical basis that actually an enormous amount of resources going through the UN into 
real human rights work. You've got UNICEF on the protection of children. You've got the people working to help implementation of the Disabilities Convention. You've got uh, all of us who are involved in some way with CEDAW, the, the, the Women's uh, Convention. The, the list could go on a great deal, but we are very, very active. Obviously, I want a strong Human Rights Commission, but I also want to see this long-term work that I'm talking about properly funded, because if we come back to what will really be the long-term answer to conflict prevention, it is the peaceful and inclusive societies based on the rule of law where people's rights are upheld. Okay, it's this lady in the fourth row at the very end, and I initially picked her, and you pre preempted. That's okay. You, I, it was a very good question. My name is Hanna Zadig. I'm the Horn of Africa Director of the Life and Peace Institute, an international peace building organization working with the African Union. And my question is on the AU, African Union and UN relationship and how you see kind of a reinterpretation of chapter eight in terms of regional arrangements of the relationship between the African Union and the, Af and, and the UN, given that the AU is increasingly taking on so much of the peacekeeping operations, how do you see um, that going forward and that partnership, especially in the wake of the HIPPO uh, reviews? Thank you. Well, there, there is a, a phrase, and it was used at my meeting with the African group of uh, permanent representatives yesterday, uh, that they want African solutions to, to African uh, problems. Of course, where the partnership with the UN can be extremely helpful is that in a peace and security crisis, the UN mandate for an African Union-led force uh, should also bring with it resourcing and support for that for that force. You know, African peacekeepers are carrying an incredible burden of, of trying to maintain some, some form of peace and stability in a number of troubled uh, countries. But, uh, they need financial training and other support to do this. So I think you know, I, I can only commit to the strongest possible relationship with the African Union and the sub-regional organisations, and, and there are many of them on the continent, from uh, you know, EGAD to ECOWAS to SADC to the East African Community, many, many uh, organisations. Uh, but my impression for a long period of time, going well back even before I was Prime Minister, was that the UN does need the regional organisations to be strong and vibrant, to do things that it, it doesn't necessarily have the strength to do itself, but collectively, in a partnership, we can do better together. You've been very patient and you've been right in front and so I've been avoiding you, but I'm gonna get you the next question. Here it is. Thank you. Um, so my name is Thomas Liu and I'm currently a junior in high school. And so I've done MUN for a couple of years and I've also been in UNDP committee. So that's why it got me interested to be here today. And since I'm from Taiwan and I came from Taiwan three years ago, I just want to ask a question about like the status of Taiwan and what the UN can do. Because currently Taiwan is a um, observer in the WHO. And so what can the UN itself do to um, let Taiwan be um, accepted in sub-UN organizations, at least as an observer or as a, like a partial member? So because um, there's 23 million people that is um, unrepresented okay. across the Thank world. You. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I mean, very, very difficult issue. Uh, <laughs> um, but often there are pragmatic ways of working with difficult issues. And over my years as New Zealand Prime Minister, I went to eight APEC summits. Now these were always billed as summits of economic leaders. And at that table sat the leader of the People's Republic of China and the leader uh, elected by Taiwan. So it was a pragmatic solution, which recognised that Taiwan had a significant economy. Uh, Hong Kong also sat there with the, the chief executive in a, in a pragmatic way. So I think, you know, look, look for, for pragmatic ways of uh, seeing that, uh, you know, where it's needed, um, there can be, can be presence. And uh, you, know, you instance the health area. Actually, uh, health threats know no boundaries that we as human beings put around them or that, or that geography tries to construct. If there's avian flu, you want Taiwan to be as well equipped to fight that as, as, as anybody else and so on. Okay, right, uh, second to the back, right next to where you were sitting. Here you found her. 
Hi, thank you for speaking today. My name is Emily Litsis. I'm a recent graduate from American University, and I spent the last year living and doing research in Turkey with a Borean scholarship. So I wanted to ask um, Prime Minister Clark, you mentioned in an article recently that our approach to the, the situation of the migrant crisis in Syria needs to be different than the conventional you know, relief now and development later. Yeah. What are your thoughts on what the UN can do to pivot their approach um, in the immediate future. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I do have very, very strong views on this. <laughs> I feel that uh, you know, for at least the first three and a half years or so in, of the Syria crisis, uh, the international response focused pretty exclusively on relief. And relief alone doesn't cut it. Uh, now, why do people flee Syria? Actually, a lot of them are not fleeing because their neighborhood is convulsed in violence. A lot of them are fleeing because actually their children hadn't been in school for quite a long time. The services weren't working. Uh, there wasn't you know, a capacity to earn an income. Very basic things. And we all know that the ultimate solution to the Syrian crisis is a political settlement, and it can't come soon enough, but it's, it's, it's elusive. But where the international attention has now started to re-pivot, and UNDP uh, has played, I think, a pivotal role in the re-pivoting, is to say, let, let us see what we could do to try to stabilize the situation for people within Syria, which gives them some dignity and independence because there's no satisfaction in standing in the end of a food queue or having to wait for charity. And so there has been a reorientation of funding uh, over the last couple of years, and I can only encourage more of this, uh, which sees us able to work at the local level in generating jobs, training youth, empowering women, microcredit, getting the power back on, the water back on, the services running, UNICEF with the schooling, WHO and UNFPA with the health, the, the list goes on. You know, there are emergency developmental things we can do that will enable people to hang on in Syria in the hope that help might come. Now, clearly this is not the case for every part of Syria. We see the besieged areas where people have been literally starving, horrible situation. We see Aleppo as a catastrophic battleground or, or Homs. But within Syria, there are six and a half million people displaced from places of violent conflict. They're trying also to, you know, to stand up and want their children's schools. So we have to have a kind of invest in the people in Syria first. There's 19 million of them still there. Four and a half million may have left, but 19 million still there. The next sort of line of, of, of action and very important is what happens in the neighborhood. Uh, the support that's given to Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan, which are carrying an extraordinary global burden, actually. And again, their needs have not been so well acknowledged until the last year, 18 months or so. Now that support is coming for them. And I said in the, the major debate we did last night, broadcast on Al Jazeera, full marks to Turkey, which has legitimized Syrians working in Turkey. That's resilience, standing on your own feet, able to move out of the refugee camp, you know, provide for your family, have your children in the schools, be part of the society for as long as you're a guest there. Uh, Jordan has begun to issue work permits. Hope Lebanon will. But you know, we have been very, very active on what would help people build their resilience to these shocking events that are going on and have, and have some kind of dignity in their lives. Okay, I'm going to take one last question. We'll get you right down here in the third row. And because then I'm going to save time for people who want to do selfies and all that kind of thing when they're on the way out. All right? You Prime Minister last question. Helen Clark, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm a New Zealander from Christchurch who's been here since 2007 for university and then stayed afterwards. Um, and I'm very excited about your, your campaign. Uh, my question is, what do you see as the most pressing issues facing LGBT people worldwide and what will you do to advance the rights of LGBT people as Secretary General if you're elected? Well, I mean, I, I could also speak with great passion on this as someone uh, who has been, you know, very, very supportive of the community at home and uh, heading UNDP, which really does bat away to try to work 
to see that human rights apply to everybody irrespective of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, the whole rich mix of humanity is entitled to human rights. Now, you know, clearly the, the situation is extremely difficult in a number of countries, but uh, count on me to be an advocate for everybody's human rights and no marginalisation and stigmatisation of minorities for whatever reason. I hope all of you feel as privileged as I have been to have to have the Prime Minister speak to us directly. Not talking down to us, not talking through us or around us, but talking to us. And it's been a rare opportunity this thank afternoon. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you, and we're delighted to have you. Let's thank her with our applause. Thank you. Thank you.